Now, in this video, I said I was going to teach on hypothesis testing for paired samples. But before we do that, let's do a revision of hypothesis testing for independent samples. Let's just do a quick revision and let's take one more example. Then we go to hypothesis testing for paired samples. Let's look at this example. Now, the leaders of the study are interested in determining whether there is a difference in mean annual contribution for individuals covered by TSAs and those with 401k retirement program. As I always say, the information in this question will not help you write the hypothesis. So let's add additional information, all right? Let's add an additional information, okay? Let's add additional information. Now here, uh, additional information is that, let's add that managers claim that the contribution for individuals covered by TSA is greater than that of 401k, all right? Managers claim that the contribution for individuals covered by TSA is greater than that of 401k. Now, let's assume TSA to be group one and then 401k to be group two. So remember, the claim is that group one is greater than group two, okay? So the claim is that group one is greater than group two. That means that the null hypothesis will be that the group one is less than the opposite of this, so the less than or equal to group two. I can rewrite this as now group one minus group two is less than or equal to zero. Because when this one crosses, that's how this one crosses to this side, that's how it will be. And I can write the alternative as group one minus group two, because when this one crosses, it becomes negative, is greater than zero. So if you draw your curve, draw your curve, group one, my, so we draw it based on the now, so group one minus group two is equal to zero. So the now says it should be less. So everything here is less than, because the middle is zero. So we are looking for everything here to be accepted. But obviously we allow for a little more, okay? We allow for a little more, okay? We allow for a little more. We allow for a little more. But we need to determine the T value to know the critical bound here, all right? So everything here, oh, sorry. Let me use the red one. Everything here is the rejection region, okay? Everything here is the rejection region. So let's look at the question. Because the question gave sample standard deviation, it means you are going to use the T. Now, when you are computing your own T, okay, there is the formula, but let's look at the observed T, I mean, the critical T to determine the bound. Now, remember, we will need two things. We will need the degree of freedom. That's N1 plus N2 minus two. So N1 was 10, N2 was eight minus two, you get 16. So the degree of freedom is 16, okay? And then we are testing at 95% confidence per the question. So it means that the alpha for the only one tail, for only one tail, only one of the tails, the alpha is 0 0.05 for only one of the tails. Because it's only one tail, it's not two tails, all right? 
we are going to look in the T table, degree of freedom of 16, then only one of the two is 0 0.05. So only one of the tail is 0 0.05. Only one of the tails is 0 0.05. Then the degree of freedom is 16. So where they meet, we have 1.746. Where they meet is 1.746. So where they meet is 1.746 here. Only one of the tails is 0 0.05. The degree of freedom was 16. So where they meet is 1.746. So the critical T is 1.746. Now we have to compute our own T, then we compare with the critical T. So mean one minus mean two, okay. Minus the population mean one minus population mean two, all over the pool standard deviation, square root of one over N1 plus one over N2. So we need to find our pool standard deviation using the long formula. So it's just in the slides here. So the pool standard deviation, you just fix in the figures, you face in the sample standard deviation squared of group one, that of group two, you just fixed in the figures because they are all here. Then you get a pool standard deviation to be this 50.55. All right. Then let's come to our computer T. The mean of group one. Okay. The mean of group one is 322.5. Mean of group two is, and all of them will be given, given in the question, 298.3, 298.3. Then standard deviation and population, sorry, sample size one is 10, sample size two is eight. So remember, first of all, compute your pool standard deviation and I've shown you. So the T will be equal to this minus that, minus um, U1 minus U2, all over pool standard deviation, which we have computed over one over N1 plus one over N2. We are gonna get 322.5 minus 298.3. And based on the hypothesis, U1 minus U2 is zero, all right? So minus zero all over the pool standard deviation. The pool standard deviation was 50.55. You have to compute it yourself using the long formula. So 50.55 times square root of one over N1 is 10 plus one over N2 is eight. So if you do everything correctly, your computed T should be 1.0093. Your computed T should be 1.0093. So our T will be 1.0093. 1.0093. All right, 1.0093. So if I draw it in the curve, okay, one point, so our computed T will be le is less than this T. So our computed T, 1.0093. Then it's within the acceptance region, all right? It is within the acceptance region. So we are going to accept it. Or we will fail to reject. So here, since our computed T is 1.0093, less than the critical T of 1.0093, 745 now, 1.746 is the same thing if you round it. Okay. If you want to show which of the T's is critical, you bring the tail, the alpha of the tail here. 
to, it means the second one here is the critical one, all right? Then the first one is the computer. So since it's less, we do not reject or we fail to reject the now hypothesis, all right? Okay, so in the next video, I'm going to actually begin the third samples test. So we are done with confidence interval and hypothesis testing for independent samples. Thank you.